Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Um, thanks for coming. I know this is the third genomics talk. If you heard cotton seeds, and also uh, some of you may also heard uh, Frank's talk about endom. Uh, so just before I start, so how many of you know metagenome? Oh, there's, oh there, there, there's a couple. And how many of you know genomics in general? OK. And for the rest of the people, do you know that the alphabet of genome is AGCT? OK. That's good. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a um, early exploration of using Spark to solve metagenome problem. First of all, I'll explain what is metagenome. <clears throat> so we know ourselves, right? And sometimes we, I say I, but in a scientific term, from a metagenome, like a metagenome is really a community of microbes. We have a lot of microbes that live with us. We really should see we or us. And that means I and the microbes live um, with me. And when we look at the human image, you know, from a metagenome viewpoint, he or she might be just take the form like this. And now we just have lunch. You know, your gut microbes probably are working to extract nutrient uh, from your lunch now. So as you, we shake hands, we probably exchange a bunch of microbes. So we are really living uh, within a cloud of microbes, OK? And and obviously, you know, they are almost everywhere. And in the human's case, we have about a thousand different species living with on us and within us. And in a cow, in the animal's gut, there are also microbes. Like in the cow, there's about six thousand different species. But these uh, number of species compared to those in the soil really is nothing, because in the soil, there's over a million different species uh, in the soil. And we still don't know how many, because there isn't a study can uh, thoroughly uh, study that system. And for every 100 species we discover from our environment, from this collection of, of microbes, 90 of them, we will have no idea. We haven't seen them before, and they're likely to represent new species. Okay. And these microbial species are also very important. We know those microbes live with us. They impact our health and nutrition. And the cow, obviously, is very important. They produce milk and meat production. And the soil really are so important for the agriculture. Agriculture, that's you know, our food source. So we need to study them, but how? So in a typical metagenome experiment, we first we will harvest microbes from all different kinds of environments. And then we'll extract DNA, we'll break up this, the micro cell and release these circular uh, um, genomes, because most bacterial genomes are circular. They're about a few million um, um, letters long of AGCT. And since we don't have a technology to read one genome at a time, so currently we actually will break these long pieces of DNA into shorter pieces, and then we can sequence them. And then, since after the, uh, this step, we don't know which piece belongs to which genome, so then we'll go through a metagenome assembly um, process, trying to reconstruct uh, the, comp the near complete genome of each different species. Okay? So, this reconstruction process, I know all of you are computer scientists, so I will use an analogy here. So, here I'll try to use a book. A book, you know, a genome is really a book, right? It's a, it's, it's a, a long string of AGCTs. And metagenome is really here. It's really a library of books. You know, there are some rare books because we have rare species in the community, and there's also a common um, species. Then they will have a lot of copies. And during the sequencing process, we break all the books. We shred them into uh, those pieces, and then we're trying to 
our job for assembly is really try to reconstruct this library from these shred pieces. And, and of course, we don't get all the pieces, and each time of a metagenome sequencing experiment is actually a sampling of this pile of pieces. You, you, you can also understand that the more sampling you have, the more chance you'll recover those rare books, right? So we have two big challenges for the metagenome process. So first is really the scale. Um, and if we talk about just a regular small scale metagenome experiment, we need in the order of 10 to 100 gigabytes of data to be able to get a good understanding of this community. And for uh, two largest uh, studies so far in the human and in the cow, uh, we produce about one terabyte of data from these two single studies. So this is just a single study. This is in contrast to uh, what Condensin mentioned. Uh, in all the broad data, they have 45 terabytes, but that's a lot of genome. But here we're just talking about one sample. And we actually, you know, f in order to study, to get a deep understanding of the soil of the genome, um, we project that we we'll probably need hundreds of ter terabytes or even petabytes to be able to get a good standing of soil. Of course, you know, getting a, a petabytes of data from the soil is still very expensive. And the, the other enemy of metagenome assembly is really the complexity. Complexity have two aspects. One is the, simply the data uh, complexity. And sometimes you know, when we get the data, we also get con contaminants during the lab experimental process. And the complexity is also defined by the number of species we have in the community and also the, their abundance distribution. Um, and the sequence process also generates noise because they are not 100% accurate. A, a second aspect of the assembly um, complexity is really the algorithm complexity. Like many bio, bioinformatic pipelines, we, we, we often need several steps to remove um, this noise and to transform the data in different ways. And each step may have very different time and space complexity, which makes the performance improvement harder. So um, the ideal solution, so a few years ago I started to work on this problem, I was I always started dreaming. So it has to be easy to, to develop. We are by, by formatations, we don't want to spend a lot of time coding. Uh, and it has to be robust. And it, it, if we need to run things multiple times, it can't just fail um, very often. And we like you know, the program once we wrote, we'll automatically scale to a large data. And we like to get an answer fast. We like our solution to be efficient. Um, so this, I'm going back a little bit to the pre-Spark, we call them dark ages. Um, so the first solution we, come up, we came up with in 2009, actually, you know, we realized to crunch of big data, we need a lot of memory. So we get, the, at that time, we get um, six servers with half terabytes of RAM uh, for each of them and connect to a very high speed uh, I.O. system. So to sometimes address the memory and the, the I.O. problem associated with uh, and big data. So this is really pioneered by uh, a very talented hardware engineer, uh, Jeremy Brand, and JGI. And also, our effort got attention uh, from a company called Convi, and they also, um, we worked together trying to use FPGA to accelerate uh, the computation. So I won't go detail, but just you know, at the end of the day, you know, we end up spending a million dollars, but we're only able to get a uh, hundred gigabytes also. So then um, a group, a very talented software engineer within my group, Rob Egan, he said, I'll solve this problem. Yeah, let's go to the, the route of MPI. So he actually developed a very fast and scalable um, MPI solution. We can um, crunch half a terabyte of data um, with only a few hours uh, with um, 108 nodes on NERSC um, Hopper supercomputer. 
And uh, you know, of course, this solution is probably not a very good solution either, because we really need these ex experienced uh, software engineers, and we keep losing them to Google and Amazon. And we need a lot of this, the, even for the experienced software engineers, we we'll still need a lot of development time to take care of the parallelism, to take care of the robustness. And the robustness is really not perfect. You know, you know, a lot of time, when one of the tests fails, the entire task will fail. And in 2013, we're so glad that we have a Hadoop. And also with PIC, PIC you know, make program Hadoop much easier. So we develop a platform called Biopic. It's basically uh, trying to engineer some of the bioinformatic routines uh, onto the Hadoop Pick framework. We're able to scale the data. Um, see, these uh, blue lines are one of the typical application. Um, it, we can scale all the way to half of terabytes, while the serial program failed to about uh, one gigabyte, and the MPI solution stopped at about 100. So you probably already noticed, in terms of the time, um, the Hadoop solution is much, much slower than MPI solution. Uh, so it's actually two to three orders of magnitude slower. And also we notify we need to do a lot of IO optimization because during the analysis, we typically just run out of disk space on the Hadoop cluster. And some of the problem may not easily fit in, in this MapReduce uh, paradigm, um, like this graph-based algorithms. And if we run on Amazon um, cloud computing platform, you know, slower means you pay more. Um, so we need a better solution here. So I guess probably all of you know what I'm going to talk about, right? Yes, yeah, Spark. Yeah. So just uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't read this what I wrote there, but you know, Spark is scalable, it's efficient, it's easy to develop, and probably is very robust. And all of these things just make us uh, just without any hesitation, we dive into the Spark business. Um, so here, so the goal is really we want to assemble the metagenome, but we want to solve the first task first. Um, if we could cluster those reads based on the other genome or origin, we effectively transform a metagenome problem to a single genome problem. Single genome problem we are very comfortable to deal with. And we like this solution to be able to scale to terabytes of scale. So the algorithm is really four steps. I know it's a little bit complicated here, but let me try to explain. So to the, the, really the core of this algorithm, we utilize this, uh, those things called cameras uh, or engrams um, for computer scientists. So we will first identify those um, outliers in terms of abundance in, in the data set. Those are likely to represent of the con contaminations. And then we will um, use the number of shared cameras between those short pieces of reads to identify those reads that belong to the same genome, right? If we get um, two reads, they share a significant number of cameras, then that's, we predict them from the same genome. So we will, to do that, we will first we will use the camera as a key and read IDs and the value to build those uh, key value pairs. And then we'll group them, and then we can use this to, to build a read graph. Um, the read and node and the uh, edges are their number of shared cameras they have. And then we can do a little bit of filtering to remove those noise. And then at, at the last step, uh, we need to partition the graph uh, we can either use connected component or um, power iteration clustering. So you can see um, this is first, I think there's three points here. So first, this data is uh, unstructured. You know, we, we can't do whatever Cotton C did. You know, they are dealing with the structure of the genetic data. Here, the, the data we're dealing with is completely unstructured. Uh, so the second point is, you know, the RDD is a very good for, uh, format for us to, to implement the first uh, two graph, uh, uh, the, the second step. And also, um, Spark's graph X is perfect for our uh, third step to build a real graph. 
and some of the machine learning library from Spark is perfect for the last step. So um, we developed the software basic on um, standalone class that we run some an analysis on on-demand Spark clusters using NERSC HPC as well. And the majority of the work uh, we, we ran actually using um, Amazon's Elastic Map, Map Reduce framework. So I think for the ma majority of the results we got is actually from EMR. So to make sure the algorithm we develop is correct, so we construct a very simple toy data set. We put six uh, small microbial species there. Uh, they're only about 10 KB each. And then we synthesize those metagenome communities uh, and implement some noise too. And with sufficient uh, sequence and courage, we show that the algorithm actually worked perfectly with this um, toy data. So we decided to go ahead using real world um, metagenome data set. And we picked three different type. We, we have uh, soil in metagenome data set. Uh, these are, have a large number of species. And the sampling depth for each of the species are really low. And we have a cow rumen metagenome data set. And these have a fairly, has about 6,000 number of species. And the sampling depth is uh, from low to medium. And we also, since we don't have a real metagenome that have very high uh, sampling depth, so we decided to use a similar type of data set called transcriptome uh, to emulate. Uh, you have a fewer number of species, but a very high uh, sampling depth to, to, to just to see what's the Spark performance on different data set. Uh, so the first thing we observe uh, as we, the program ran, the data actually explode. If we, uh, at the camera stage, if we, uh, you, you know, we set the data to one, and after we build a full graph, actually the data is about 160 to 100, 200 times um, of our input data. And then at the last step, after we filter the, the graph, it's actually reduced to about the same size as the input. So if we don't do anything, just use default Spark parameters to run the, the application. So here, so if uh, the partition size is 16 megabytes, and if we run a lot of, a lot of tasks, we see, we, uh, we see a wider range of task per task finishing time. In, in the slowest uh, task actually takes about two hours to finish. And that's really, really bad. Right? Um, so after we adjust the partition size to 1.3 megabytes, then the program runs pretty happily. Even for some of the tasks, it takes about 200 uh, seconds, but compared to the total running time, this is not very bad. Okay. So uh, we we're encouraged by this, so we did a f uh, further uh, parameter sweeping. Uh, we just uh, tried to adjust the the the, uh, the partition size and then observe their time. And we see as long as your partition size in a reasonable uh, range, uh, its performance is okay. If it's, the partition is too big or too small, uh, then the performance will drop. And we, we also try to observe the performance over different size of the data. And so under, in, on this graph, um, for small data sizes, uh, up to eight gigabytes, except the first step, the contamination prediction is um, uh, because we we're, we're take a subsample um, of the data, so its, it's time is pretty fixed. And all the other steps are scaled pretty well um, on 50 R3 X large instances on Amazon. And we do see a big performance difference if the input data is different. So for, for the cow rumen metagenome and the soil, uh, it takes about half an hour to analyze 20 gigabytes of data. But same data set, uh, same size of data set uh, on maze transcriptome will, takes about 10 times. Um, it takes about five hours to run. 
So data complexity is probably the biggest driving factor uh, for Spark performance. Um, we also estimated how much does it cost to run um, the metagenome pipeline on Amazon using spot instances. And um, so for, sorry, for uh, a typical uh, like cow and soil than the genome, uh, it costs much less uh, than, than the um, maize transcriptome data set. Uh, if, all the, if all the data set, uh, if the one terabyte of data set just like coil, uh, cow or soil, then we expect only $500 to analyze one terabyte. So that's actually not bad. Yeah, we're actually pretty happy to see this number until we're trying to actually do it. Yeah, so when we're trying to scale to 100 gigabytes of cow rumen data, actually we were not able to do it. Um, so upon to the read graph construction step, um, everything works to the fine, but in order to do the connected component step, we need to shrink the number of partitions because at, at this uh, step, the partition become too small. You remember I mentioned uh, at the, uh, after the read graph filtering, the, the, the size is about the, in, at the input size. And it seems that it takes forever to shrink the partition. Uh, so for the few tasks that are actually finished, the shrinking um, the actually takes about over uh, an hour and a half, um, and eventually it gave up. So we were not able to scale up to 100 gigabytes, not even uh, one terabyte. So we have been working with, uh, uh, with the field, you know, talked to uh, the expert from Databrick, and we got some advice, and this is really what's the next step we're trying to do. Um, so one idea is we trying to avoid shuffling. Uh, um, so by either we can generate the graph first, then we can combine those smaller partitions um, outside Spark um, to 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 avoid this problem. Um, another possibility is uh, there's a larger data set. They may uh, need a different set of parallelism parameters. Uh, to run, and since our all our parameters are actually trained on smaller data sets, so they may not apply to large ones. And of course, I would really appreciate if you guys have any input for this. Uh, we really have been struggling on this problem. So I think I have about five minutes. I'll probably just um, wrap, wrap up here. Uh, so for the metagenome assembly uh, user application, uh, our overall impression of Spark is it's very easy to develop, and especially you know there's uh, Scala, Python API, and also if you use Databricks notebook, and that just makes the development is just fun. Um, I'm not trained as a, as a computer scientist. I can write uh, Scala uh, and Python. Spark application. That's just so cool. And it's very efficient. Um, it's much, much faster than the Hadoop st solution we have. We don't have the, at the number yet. We estimate it's about 100 times faster. And also, if you uh, launch a Spark um, cluster on Amazon Cloud, you just look at this uh, node usage, and so you've got a very good usage there. So it's, it's very efficient. Um, uh, for, the ro for the robustness side, we don't have a lot of data yet, and uh, likely it would depend on what platform, uh, what cluster manager you use. We, we, we use Yarn, and some, some, some people said maybe you know, other um, um, manager will work, um, work much better. And on Amazon, we typically observe 30% uh, 30, 30 of tasks just fail uh, for various reasons. Um, and also, um, for the scalability side, um, I think it really depends on the problems. I see a lot of applications here, you know, which scales very well to petabytes of data, which really make me jealous. But you know, in our specific um, problem, the intermediate data size grows quite a bit uh, during running. And also, um, I suspect 
when the data scale up, also the connections among those reads also increases. So the, the, the problem we are solving probably the grows in complexity uh, with data. Um, so this work is mostly carried out by our Spark team, uh, Sanoman, and also our graduates from uh, Harvard, um, Jordan Hoffman. Um, and we also get a lot of help from NERSC and uh, the HPC group at LBL. And um, this work is project funded by Amazon Web Services. We, we got an uh, education grant uh, from them. And also we got a lot of advice from the folks from uh, Databricks. I think I'm going to stop here and take any, any questions. Hey, any questions for John? Thirty percent failures. I didn't quite follow. What kind of scenarios was it failing? In? Yeah. See, um, that's we are trying to get a like a pattern, right? Uh, sometimes it's because of the data itself. For some data set, we just can't get any result, even with the small scale of data. Sometimes it could be the infrastructure of EMR. Sometimes it will just lost communication. Sometimes you know the head no died. Um, yeah, this we don't see a clear pattern yet. Thank you. One other question. So, one more question for Zong. Irish in the simplicity. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, could you comment on the complexity of moving from the MPI style program into the Spark Scala, whatever you use, um, paradigm? And two, uh, what are the observations of the AWS failures? Could you expand on that as well a little bit? Okay. So, from MPI, you know. MPI is the biggest challenge for us. You know, we are mostly computational biologists. We are not very used to program MPI. And the algorithm we are trying to develop also changed quite a bit. Uh, when the data changed, um, we actually need to change the program uh, you know, a lot of time. So it's just not very economical to hire a very expensive software engineer just you know, do this. Uh, of course, you know, uh, this is, MPI is uh, still a very valid ap approach. Um, a research group at LBL actually is developing a similar solution using MPI. And they overcome, they overcome the, the scalability bottleneck. They can use hundreds of thousand nodes um, work on a big data set. Um, for the failures on AWS uh, as a, you know, the the previous audience uh, asked. Um, we're trying to get a pattern, but we just don't. And uh, some of them are due to the data or the algorithm itself. Some of them just probably just due, the, uh, due to the platform. And also, if we use um, like 400 nodes, then the failure rate actually also increases. Um, I'm not uh, re really sure. Um, what's going on, because it's still pretty expensive to run a, lar a large-scale test. Um, uh, I hope, you know, maybe um, with similar studies, uh, we are able to get a better sense of um, uh, how this failed. And, and we, we also tried using Databricks platform. That seems to be much more stable. And, you know, I, I assume it's using a different resource manager. Um, but I can't really say t too much about this. Okay, thank you very much to Dr. Zong Wang. Please show your appreciation.